Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the newest episode of Mario's History Talks. I'm your host, Mario Rostovsky, and we have a great episode for you today. So, to catch up, we've done some interviews, we've done a podcast-style episode, and we even did another on-the-scene episode live from Solon. It feels like, however, it's been a while since we've done a nice, long episode. That's taken me months to research and put together, but also answers some pretty big questions. So today, we will be attempting to answer something that's a bit of a doozy. Was the cherished and famous Ilindan Uprising designed to fail? Yes, you heard me right. So we're going to have a lot to get through today, but I think that by the end, you'll become way more well-rounded in your understanding and appreciation of Ilindan. So throughout this episode, I will be referencing Duncan Perry's magnum opus on the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization. Across both sides of the aisle, it's almost universally acclaimed as one of the most well-researched and objective books on the Macedonian Revolutionary Movement. It's called The Politics of Terror, The Macedonian Revolutionary Movement, 1893-1903. to And like all great resources out there, it is also notoriously difficult to come by. And most copies you'll find online will probably cost you an arm and a leg to purchase. However, if you are interested in finding some copies of it, definitely reach out to me. Happy to help out. So with that, definitely just take a moment now to like, comment, and subscribe down below. Make sure the post notifications are turned on as always, and connect with me on social media if you haven't already. So if you're ready, let's get started. So, in order to arrive at a satisfactory answer as to whether or not the Enidan Uprising was designed to fail or not, it is important we first get a good understanding of Bulgaria's internal matters and her foreign policy in the years leading up to the Uprising, as it will directly affect the Enidan Uprising, as we shall soon see. So, during this time period, the Great Powers essentially wanted a semblance of a status quo when it came to the Ottoman Empire. This made sense from a geopolitical standpoint, since the Ottoman Empire controlled most of the Balkans, and no matter how weak and ineffectual they were, the great powers preferred they retain dominion as opposed to their state in order to prevent from another state from sweeping in and upsetting the balance of power. To this end, to reduce the tension in the Ottoman Empire, Russia and Austro-Hungary pressured Prince Ferdinand of Bulgaria to halt the supremacists, the Vrhovisti, their agitation and Chita movements in Macedonia. You will recall that the Macedonian Supremacist Committee based out of Bulgaria, though largely comprised of Macedonian emigres, was truly an organ of the Bulgarian state and made up of Bulgarian military generals and politicians who sought to instigate and agitate that is, to provoke the Ottomans into war, and then have Bulgaria and potentially an allied Russia swoop in and liberate Macedonia and annex it to Bulgaria. However, as early as 1901, Russia announced that the armies of the Tsar were not to obstruct the Ottomans and quell any disturbances in Macedonia. So any fantasy that Mother Russia would essentially swoop in and save the day was clearly off the table, even as early as 1901. And it's important to note that leaders like Gotsdilchev knew this. He famously said, if you feed the people with such empty hopes, then you must realize that even the most outstanding hero will fall into utter despair. Keep this in mind. The great powers also expressed some foreign policy declarations towards Bulgaria as well, stating that they would not protect Bulgaria or interfere with Turkey in the execution of their special duties. So, in order to help reduce tension and show compliance, Prince Ferdinand responded by stationing more troops along the border, halting Cheta crossings going into Macedonia, and confiscating at least 2,000 rifles headed for Macedonia as well during this time period. One could say he could, of course, have done more, but uh, this would have come at a tremendous cost and the risk of alienating a large part of his army corps, which were comprised of fanatics on the Macedonian issue. 
Now, during this time period, Bulgaria's foreign policy towards Russia also shifted. Since Stoyan Danev uh, succeeded Vasil Radoslavich as the premier of Bulgaria. Now, Danev inherited an economic crisis, as well as a potential threat on their northern border coming from Romania. So, Danev needed to not only repair relations with Russia to get an economic loan, but also secure a potential military alliance with them against Romania. To ensure both those goals were met, he pledged to end supremacist Chita activity in Macedonia and even approve the confirmation, get this, a Serbian bishop in Skopje, a concession which made northern Macedonia, already increasingly Serbophile, into a virtual Serbian province. So, for all the histrionics we get from the Bulgarians stating that Macedonians were just sellouts to the Serbs, just remember, they had absolutely no problem selling off a portion of Macedonia to Serbian rule if it meant repairing relations with Mother Russia. How about that? Now, during the same time, in uh, July of 1902, Bulgaria also took the steps to arrest General Tsonchev and his aide Colonel Nikolaev, who were both very active in the supremacist movement, as well as banning arms sales and positioning more and more troops along the border with Macedonia as well. At the same time, it's also important to understand what was happening with the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization around 1902 to see how their inner workings also could have potentially led to the failure of Ilinden as well. So by this stage, the president of the Central Committee was one Ivan Gavranov, a Bulgarian extricate school teacher who had strong supremacist connections and loyalties. While it can be argued, he, can, he extended a considerable degree of influence over the Central Committee, the rest of MRO, the regional committees and the local committees still remained largely grassroots, independent, and with the goal of an autonomous Macedonia in mind. Keep this fact for later. Now, to go back slightly to add some perspective, in 1897, Gota and Gyorce Petrov revised the constitution of MRO to expand the base of membership outside only the Bulgarian extra community. The changes and aims of MRO can be summed up as follows. Number one, this is a direct quote here. The aim of the secret Macedonian Adrianople Revolutionary Organization is to unite in one whole all discontented elements in Macedonia and the Adrianople area, irrespective of nationality, to win full political autonomy for these two provinces through revolution. Number two, an end to propaganda and national dissensions which divide and weaken the population in the struggle against the common foe. For Duncan Perry, this second point appears to be aimed squarely at the supremacists and their increasing activity in Macedonia. And lastly, three, the revisions also started a partial de democratization of the organization as village committees were no longer appointed by the central committee leaving only regional committees to be appointed by them. So, all in all, based on these revisions, Perry states that on the basis of the documents that we have present, the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization cannot have been said to be promoting the dominance of one ethnic group over another in Macedonia or the union of Macedonia with Bulgaria. This is based on their 1897 constitution. So, as we can see from the revisions of the MRO statutes, leaders like Gotzedelchev and Gyorgy Petrov, they were clearly trying to defend Macedonia from supremacist propaganda and incursions. So, why do they feel a need to do so if their chief aim was to secure autonomy for Macedonia from the Ottomans? Let's take a look into this a little bit further. As early as 1902, rumors were persisting throughout the Ottoman Empire of an uprising plan for the spring of 1902 in the Monastery of Vilayet, and this was in order to provoke Russia to intervene in war. Looking at the historical record, it's not very difficult to determine why such rumors were persisting. 1902 represented somewhat of a zenith of supremacist activity and incursions in Macedonia. This is a stage in which the supremacists were regularly entering Macedonia and consistently trying to recruit whomever they could, 
and often enlisting men that the MRO had initially rejected. As Perry states, a lot of these bands were headed by, direct quote here, well-known thugs and brigands like Don Choslatev and Mihal Stavrev Halio. Higher-up leadership was arguably not much better. Leaders like Tsonchev, a Bulgarian army general in the Supremacist Committee, also did not appear to be above duplicity in a bid to recruit members. He was often quoted as saying that the two organizations, that is the MRO and the Supremacists, were in fact one and the same, and it was only their way of action that divided them. During this time period, MRO was also rife with accusations and suspicions thrown at the supremacists. MRO's new external representatives to Sofia, Tushe Delivanov and Dimitar Stefanov, publicly decried mounting Bulgarian incursions in Macedonia. In a letter distributed widely in Sofia, they argued the Supreme Committee's activities were hampering the work of the MRO in the Vilayets and were therefore against the best interests of the Macedonian cause. Elsewhere, Peter Manjukov, an MRO publicist, also accused Tonchev in 1901 of attempting to take over MRO and subverting it by having the general spies betray the activists to the police along the border. He is quoted as saying that uh, General Tsonchev's path leads through the palace, while MRO's path leads to freedom, while well, sometimes to the gallows. As a result of this vitriol, this time period also saw increased hostilities and clashes between the MRO and the supremacists, as well as the Ottomans increasing their troop size to account for increased instability. Travel by journalists and diplomats was also severely curtailed as well by the Ottomans. Now, meanwhile in Sofia, the Supremacists' 10th Macedonian Congress began on August 9, 1902. Among those hitting the decline on the Facebook invite was Dilchev himself, stating, and I quote here, the Supremacists had not honestly represented the Macedonian revolutionary organization in the past, and they were in fact more troublesome than the Turkish authorities. More than the Turkish authorities? Those are some fighting words. But anyway, during this Congress, we see a lot of inner turmoil and division amongst the supremacists, namely over the issue of whether or not to moderate their approach to Macedonia or to continue agitating. In the end, the radical wing of Mihailovsky and Sonchev managed to squeak by with a majority of the delegates and actually secure their positions to continue to push for armed incursions into Macedonia. And such an armed incursion into Macedonia happened later that August. Anastas Yankov and some 80 to 100 men moved into the Leiden coastal region, where uh, he met the legendary Vasil Chakalarov and Pando Klyashev. While there, he tried to persuade both of the men to join his cheta and start a rebellion in September, promising that the Bulgarian army and even Russia would come in to assist. Chakalarov and Klyashev, however, seem to have seen right through the ruse. Instead of forming an allyship, they actually mobilized their respective men and attacked Yankov's Chita, routing his men and eventually defeating them outright in battle. Afterwards, many of Yankov's men even ended up joining the local MRO. However, this failure did not reach Bulgaria in time to prevent more incursions into Macedonia. Apparently believing the uh, uprising had started in Macedonia, Mihailovsky sent another 18 Chetas into Macedonia with three to 400 men led by General Tsonchev in the Gorna Jumaya region. The goals of this uprising are still debated. Some Emerald leaders continue to believe that this supremacist uprising was working to provoke the Ottomans to increase their use of terror in Macedonia, thus eliciting an international response. Perry, however, is of the opinion it was simply another attempt by Tsonchev to gain control of the MRO since its regional, district, and local branches, like we said, were still largely independent. In the end, the uprising also proved to be a miserable failure. 
though it created even more catastrophic consequences than before. Few locals joined it. Based on Perry's research, some 17 out of the 40 villages actually took part in it, with no figure in how many did so willingly. In the end, the Ottomans retaliated by burning 28 villages, raping over 100 women. 3,000 villagers, by the end of this uprising, had to flee homeless into Bulgaria. However, the failed Gorna Juma uprising, as it came to be known, did succeed, perhaps unintentionally, on one major front, pushing MRO into an even tighter corner. At this stage, MRO was fighting a multi-front war. Ottomans were increasing their violence and crackdowns in the Vilayets. The Greeks, under Pavlos Melas, had recently entered Macedonia in 1902. The great powers, they were still anything but sympathetic. And to top all that off, they still had to contend with General Sonchev and the supremacists, hell-bent on controlling the organization. At this stage, the Central Committee, still headed by the supremacist-linked Ivan Gavranov, was in a precarious position. It felt that due to increased arrests, seizures, and brutality, if they did not act now in the form of rebellion, they reasoned they would risk losing a high proportion of their members to disillusionment, apathy, and arrests. As such, Gavranov set forth for a congress to be convened in January of 1903 to discuss the situation. Now, from the get-go, the ideological lines that would soon become the points of division in MRO started to form. Dr. Hristo Tatarchev and Hristo Matov were in favor of revolt, while Delchev, Sarafov, and Gyorgy Petrov were solidly opposed to it. In fact, Gyorgy Petrov was so opposed he argued brilliantly against it in an eloquent speech given amidst the debate in Sofia between MRO representatives. He also won the broad support of the attendants there and sent a letter to the Central Committee informing them that the revolt at this time would be disastrous. This letter, however, fell on deaf ears. Apparently, without so much as waiting for a reply from Sofia, Gavranov sent the invites for an Amaro Congress to be convened in Salonika on January 15th. And from what we know about it, it was held secretly in the chemistry room, again, Gavranov was a chemistry teacher, of St. Cyril and Methodius Men's High School, and 17 delegates attended. Looking at the representation there, we immediately run into some pretty big problems. For example, one delegate represented the town of Kukush, and another represented the whole vilayet of Monastir. And moreover, we also see evidence of really what amounts to an early version of gerrymandering, Gavranov having handpicked the delegates himself that would be most likely to vote for rebellion. Based on Perry's research, only one individual, Lazar Dimitrov from Ser, was a legal representative of his region. In the end, he chose to vote for revolt and ended up going against the wishes of his constituency. In another instance, we have the representative from Strumitsa, Ivan Ingilinov, voting for revolt despite his region only being able to muster a paltry 200 rifles. Many such cases were repeated from other representatives who were either there illegally, did not represent the wishes of their constituency, or voted for rebellion while knowing how drastically under-equipped they were. All in all, if we were to take into account all these facts, as well as the manner in which the, the Congress was convened, and if we compare it to the MRO Constitution, we would arrive at the conclusion that not only was the Congress constitutionally illegal in nature, not representative of the organization as a whole, but also any agreements reached would therefore not hold any legal weight. However, it is also important to add some context as to why the Central Committee and many delegates so feverishly voted in favor of rebellion. American journalist Frederick Moore stated the following, direct quote here, The high chiefs of the committee never expected to defeat the Turks with their inadequate force of untrained peasants. Their purpose was to provoke the Sultan to set his troops upon the Christians. They're willing to pay with the lives of many thousands of their brother Macedonians 
for the accomplishment of the desire, the country's autonomy. They were fanatics. End point. And while Gavranov may have genuinely believed it was a now or never situation that risked uh, you know, uh, destroying the whole of MRO, and there is some truth to this given the situation, but it's also important to remember that the task of subverting MRO to the supremacists was still top of mind as well. He did promise to hand over the MRO to the supremacists in a 1901 meeting with Mihailovsky and Sonchev. And he may have very well believed that a premature, poorly equipped uprising would be the perfect thing to not only ideologically split MRO, but also show the need for professional military backed organization coming from Bulgaria. Meanwhile, we still have the cooler headed Gotsdelchev and Gorchi Petrov trying their best to stop or at the very least delay the incoming disaster. They suggested mobilizing the Chittas as an alternative to perform terrorist attacks against Ottoman and European targets to create more regular publicity in the foreign press around the situation in Macedonia. This did win over some adherence in the circles close to Dilchev and Petrov, and it did seem like a form of compromise was being reached, but in reality, most of the MRO leadership was suffering from revolutionary fever, and logic was no longer prevailing. The compromise was ignored, and spring uprising was still pushed for. Now at this stage, Dilchev and Petrov and other dissidents, they had a pretty difficult decision to make. They could ultimately reject the decision of the MRO and risk further destabilizing and factionalizing the organization, or play an active hand in the planning to at least try to control the affairs and navigate away from more certain destruction. They chose the latter, and at least pushed to postpone the uprising until after the spring harvest, that is, to go into the summer months. This was to ensure maximum participation from the peasants. In Perry comments, it's also worth noting that Gavranov was able to single-handedly okay postponing the rebellion without consulting the Central Committee, more proof that he was largely acting on his own accord and not with the members of the Central Committee. And meanwhile, around this time, Dilchev is traveling to Ceres to attend a regional conference on St. George's Day. His whereabouts, of course, were betrayed to the Ottomans, and he is killed on May 4th after a small skirmish in Banitsa. The Macedonian revolutionary movement had just lost not only its voice of reason, but arguably the very soul of the movement as well. Despite all this information that they very well knew, the preparations and planning for the uprising were still well underway. On May 2nd, 1903, 32 delegates representing eight military regions, that's Ohrid, Lerin, Bitola, Kostur, Kichevo, Prilip, Dimirkisar, and Resen, convened in the village of Smilevo to draw out the blueprints for the attack. Led by Damik Gruev, the Congress reaffirmed that the monastery of Vilayet would be the ideal place to stage the uprising. It was mainly extricate populated, both Macedonians and Vlachs alike, and had low instances of Serbian propaganda, and was sufficiently far from Sofia as well to not be associated with Bulgaria. More importantly, it probably represented the region most brutalized by the Ottomans, therefore having a population most agitated for revolt. And despite this, though, the Congress made a special point to forbid the burning of Muslim villages without provocation or brutality against women and children. Equally important, the Congress also determined that the primary method of engagement would be essentially guerrilla-type warfare, with chitas of 30 to 50 men. In the words of one Indian veteran, their goal was not to defeat the Ottomans in battle, but not be defeated by them. However, the Smilovo Congress also leaves us valuable insight into not only the lack of unity around the decision to revolt, but also the alarming lack of preparedness for it that was still ignored. According to the Voivoda Slaveko Arsov, all of Resin and Prespo, they could muster some 960 rifles with not nearly enough ammo for them. Meanwhile, Resin, Demirkisar, and Okrit, in some districts of Bitola, collectively could only produce about 1,400 rifles. 
All in all, Autosilf estimated that there were perhaps a total of 8,000 rifles in all, most of them highly inaccurate and cheap made grass rifles. And while some regions like Kostur were still eager and impatient to start the revolt, others like Prilip, Marievo, and Khrushchevo still condemned the revolt and could only be reconciled by, all by being allocated more rifles and ammunition, shrinking an otherwise already undersupplied inventory. Dame Gruff himself, who had previously agreed with the decision to revolt, also expressed doubts about the timing of it, stating flat out that he did not believe the population was sufficiently prepared. And finally we come to the momentous date of eating then, July 30th per the old calendar or August 2nd in our new calendar. It started off with the burning of haystacks, then telegraph wires were cut, bridges were blown up, and strategically important buildings were occupied. We know how the rest of it plays out for the most part. What's interesting though is that based on Perry's research, it seems that MRO was actually telling the peasants the truth, not to expect any foreign help. But at the same time, it also seems that owing to the heavy Gavranov propaganda, most peasants nonetheless still believed that a Christian state would swoop in at the last minute to save Macedonia. The very thing Dilchev warned against, feeding the population with such false hopes. Of course, no such thing occurred. While there was early success given the surprise nature of the attacks and subsequent optimism amongst the uh, population, this of course did not last long. Perry states that l given the lack of real direction and trained leaders, they often suspended their military activities to celebrate their feats and newfound liberty. Direct quote there. Said differently, they did not seize the window of opportunity to consolidate their gains. By September, the situation had become so desperate that even the regions that did not want to participate in the uprising ended up entering the fray. Such was the case with the Ser region, Yanis Sandansky's territory, who had entered into an uneasy alliance with the supremacists, namely General Tsonshev from before, given the lack of manpower and weapons that he had to work with. At the same time, in desperation, the MRO general staff, ironically enough, pleaded with Bulgaria for military intervention. However, none of this proved to be enough. No way to come from anywhere, much less Bulgaria. Even places where provisional governments were set up, like Khrushchevo, Nevesk, and Krisora, they soon received a sustained and brutal counterattack from the Ottomans. Here are some statistics that paint a bigger picture for you. Based on Perry's research, uh, looking at the MRO memoir, we have listed 26,408 fighters in chitas of 50 to 200 men from July 29th to November 19th, facing a force of 350,931 askes. Those are 13 to 1 odds. By the end of the uprising, 4,696 Christian non-combatants were killed. 201 villages burned, 12,440 houses damaged, and 3,122 women and girls raped by the Ottomans. By the end of all this, 70,835 people were left homeless. In the interest of being fair, it must be stated that despite the MRO expressly forbidding attacks on Muslim non-combatants in villages, there is significant data concerning such attacks on Muslim villages in the Lerin and the Mirhisar region, which, ironically enough, actually activated more Muslim participants against the uprising, squashing any and all hopes of them remaining neutral. So, what was the actual impact of the Ilindan uprising when looking at the different parties' objectives? Let's start with the goal of the MRO Central Committee which was to force the great powers to act against the Ottomans in support of Macedonian autonomy and independence. Despite significant newspaper coverage and the sympathies in the European public for the suffering of fellow Christians, little was changed in the arena of international relations for Macedonia. The great powers remained neutral as stated on numerous occasions, and the only action taken was the Merstag reforms, which, like many of its predecessors, 
was an attempt to end corruption and persecution in Macedonia, and just like its predecessors, was agreed to and quickly shelved off, never to be implemented. As for the supremacists, however, it can be argued that their goal was ultimately achieved. MRO became fragmented, decentralized, in a shadow of its former self. Most importantly, though, MRO was decidedly under supremacist control after Edendon. Here's what Perry has to say, direct quote here. In fact, they ultimately gained control of the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, thanks largely to Gavranov's efforts to foment the Edendon Uprising, a premature rebellion which was doomed to fail from the start. Some anti-Gavranov MROists and scholars believe this had been Gavranov's intent all along when he pressed for revolt. Direct quote there. By the end, two ideological camps had emerged from the splintered MRO. We have Gavranov and his supremacist allies, which pushed more and more for a greater Bulgarian policy. And then we have Sandans Sandansky's camp, which took over the remnants of the original Vomero and continued to fight for an autonomous Macedonia to the very end. So, now in closing, a couple of points can be made with this new perspective. While Edendon still rightfully holds its place of honor in the Macedonian mythos, I mean my own family having fought in it, we can at least look at it now with a more complete view. While it was doomed to fail, and perhaps even intentionally, that does not subtract anything from the, hero from the heroic sacrifices of our Macedonian fighters, who ultimately died with their last thought being a free and independent Macedonia. But in understanding why it failed, we ultimately see a familiar pattern emerge. Native Macedonian organizing and planning, such as what we saw during the Macedonian Uprising in 1878, was successful until it no longer remained native. While MRO was preparing the Macedonian population for revolt, both materially and psychologically, what happened during Edendon was not the fulfillment of their vision. And secondly, when we look at the conflicts and clashes between the MRO and the supremacists, we can hold two things to be true at the same time. While the conflicts and the bad blood between the two was of a political nature rather than an ethnic one, keep in mind both groups were largely made up of Macedonians, they still do show that Macedonian interests and Bulgarian interests were becoming more and more irreconcilable. Duncan Perry makes this case abundantly clear. He posits that ironically enough, had the Bulgarian consciousness actually been stronger in MRO and elicited more of a desire to cooperate with the Bulgarian state, with the Bulgarian army and politicians, it may have proved successful. But knowing this was not the case in reality, when we look at the extremes that the Bulgarian-oriented supremacists had to go through to ensure that the Macedonians were not left to decide their own futures and fates on their own, you better damn well believe they knew this to be true as well. So folks, that wraps up today's episode of Mario History Talks. Again, a lot of content there, so I definitely encourage you to revisit it, rewatch it, take some notes. Again, hopefully you walk away knowing a little bit more about eating than you did before. So uh, it's been my great pleasure to deliver this episode to you. Again, more content will be coming up soon. But uh, in the meantime, let's connect on social media. Let's continue the conversation there. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. In the meantime, I hope you stay safe. I hope you keep fighting for Macedonia. And until next time, let's keep positive.